Well, thank you uh, very much for letting me discuss these projects today. I'm the uh, current programmer on these two things. Um, this is sort of the primordial encode encyclopedia. And uh, Factorbook is a product of the lab from some papers that were written back in 2012. And I've been working on the updating the code base. So let's start out with um, encyclopedia. So, Louder? Okay. Okay, I'll talk that way then. So ENCODE has been tremendously successful getting all of these human experimental uh, data sets up. We have hundreds and hundreds of data sets over several different assays. But the first three letters of ENCODE, E and C, are for encyclopedia. And we don't quite have that yet. And this is something that's becoming an increasing concern. And we've been discussing at some of the ENCODE consortium meetings and some of the phone calls. So, we would like to integrate this data together and actually figure out the function elements and build and visualize the encyclopedia. In my mind, I kind of see the, the, the visualization someday as Google Maps for the genome. You could have a very, very far zoomed out view that has long range interaction information, high C 3D context sort of information, and then you can zoom all the way down to a single base pair and look up SNP data and whatnot. So I don't know how to do that yet but we can start out with something a little bit simpler. To do functional annotation, uh, there was actually a very nice analogy made by this paper from, uh, as co-authored by uh, Snyder and Gerstein. You can kind of think of building functional annotations as doing signal analysis. You start out with a raw signal, you smooth it, you normalize it, you threshold it, and then you can start actually segmenting it and building up pieces and pieces with higher and higher amounts of information and data. Right now, in the ENCODE project site, there's already a few different annotations available. And there are different levels of complexity. You could just look at transcription start sites. You could just look at uniformly processed peaks that you can all now produce from the last session. Um, you can look at 3D content information. Uh, Luca will talk about uh, using uh, hidden Markov models in Chrome HMM to actually do the segmentation. And you can do um, dynamic Bayesian nets. Today, though, I'm going to talk about making an annotation using four uh, candidate enhancers and promoters. Now, this is going to be based upon uh, DNA and histone marks. And both of these give information about the, um, the chromatin structure. DNA may include regulatory elements besides enhancers and promoters. But for a DNA peak that's been, that has an, an enhancement of, HK, of uh, for instance, H3K27AC, you have a pretty good likelihood that it's actually going to be an enhancer. So we're going to build up an annotation on DNA and histone, histone marks, and hopefully display it in the browser. Um, based upon both the data availability and based upon many of the factors that have kind of been hinted at this morning, uh, we're using four different histone marks. Uh, 4ME3 to annotate promoters, 9AC for promoters and enhancers, 27AC for enhancers, as well as 4ME1. Now, to start with, um, we had the STAM lab take all the DNA seq um, experiments available from ENCODE and ROMAP and merge them together. This gives us a unified view of chromatin uh, accessibility across all the cell types we have. Now, this includes all the STAM and Crawford DNA data sets and all the biological and technical replicates. But we didn't just do uh, a bed tools merge on all these data sets. We did something a little bit different. We take the DNA data sets and look at a region where all the peaks overlap. So for instance here, we have n different cell types, and some of these cell types have no peaks, but others have you know, more or less overlapping DNA peaks. The diagram is perhaps a bit oversimplified. But. So you can merge these in, into a pile that kind of looks like this. Instead of taking the entire pile as one region, what we call a DNA hypersensitive region, we're going to select something we call the master peak. And that's the peak with the strongest signal. That peak will become the representative peak for that region. And we will discard the rest of the peaks in that area. The weak peaks shall not inherit the region. Okay. Now, from these master peaks, we have a few advantages. We get this set of unique, non-overlapping peaks. We get this representative peak for this area. And that peak we annotate with all the cell types that are involved in that region. These peaks can span all the data sets. 
And when you actually merge them all together, they cover about 20% of the genome. From this track, from this set of master peaks, we can then divvy these up into transcription start site proximal and transcription start site distal peaks. The TSS proximal, they're within 2 KB of a uh, gen code um, TSS annotation. OK, so now we can actually start looking at annotating candidate promoters. For, for us, the candidate promoter is going to be two things. One, they're going to be a TSS proximal master peak. And then two, they're going to be, uh, have an annotation with a TF binding site. For now, we use all the ChIP-seq TFs, all uh, either gap peak or narrow peak, whatnot, uh, from ENCODE. So we, we, did a bit, we did a humongous bed merge, and bed tools merge, and um, build an annotation track. These peaks are also uh, TSS proximal. For candidate enhancers, we do something similar, but with one extra step. We're going to use, for enhancers, we're going to use the distal peaks, like I alluded to before, um, and we're going to annotate them with TF peaks. But we're also going to look at 27AC enrichment. So given the master peak, we're going to go into the 27AC signal file, look at that region, look at a 1KB region, and, and compute the um, a percentile of that signal over background. Background being you know, randomly chosen uh, segments of, the, of that um, signal track, you know, ignoring other locations with DNA peaks and uh, um, in the encode blacklist. So if um, this 27AC region is in the 95th percentile, we're going to call that a candidate enhancer. Okay. Now, um, as a little bit of a justification, we can do this, we can do just what I talked about on one cell, cell line, so a uh, cell type. You can look at GM12878, we can look at enrichment of TSX proximal, proximal DNA peaks uh, and see how they're enriched in 27AC peaks. And we find that, yeah, for the actual DNA peaks, they have very strong enrichment. Same thing happens for the distal peaks. Now, um, how well do the master peaks fare? You can take um, all the 27AC peaks in a, for all the different cell types we're using, and you can intersect those with the master peaks for each particular cell type. So for instance, um, we may have uh, pancreas here, and we're going to take um, a gap peak uh, file for 27AC, and we're going to intersect that with the master peaks that, that have um, the pancreas cell type in them. And we see that more than three quarters of the 27AC peaks also intersect one of our DNA's master peaks. Swapping that around, we can look at the um, master peaks for each cell type and see what, how many, what per percentage of, that, of those peaks are covered by 27AC. And we see that that percentage is a good bit lower. There are other things going on with those peaks, as we kind of alluded to before. So that's it. That's how we actually build these tracks. It's a bunch of uh, Python and shell scripts awk and bed tools. So where can you actually get these tracks? As, um, as, as Mike and Yuri mentioned, um, you can get them from the uh, ENCODE project site under annotations. And um, you can actually go to the genome browser right now if you want, or to the WashU browser, and look through them and, and look for your favorite region. Uh, you can also directly download all the tracks that we actually uh, produced. And uh, these are big bed files. And Yuri has uh, committed them into the ENCODE project, and they have a, a unique ascension number, so you, I cannot change these on you under your feet. You can always go back and get the exact file that you were using. These are the links um, typed out. Um, as mentioned yesterday, uh, I prefer using the Track Hub uh, because it actually is super easy to generate. Um, and you can look in here and, and actually see how to colorize your track or uh, fiddle with the track a little bit. We also produce um, tracks for WashU called hammock tracks. These tracks are really designed specifically for annotation. And you can actually embed JSON data into the track file and uh, uh, give the user a little bit more information. There's some more information about the hammock track here, and I'll have a little demonstration shortly. So this is what it looks like in the UCSC Genome Browser. And if you actually click on one of the annotations, you can get things like, for instance, for, if you click on DNAs, you can get all the cell types involved from that region, just as promised before. Um, as a kind of a side note, uh, when using these tracks, you may want to enable these other tracks in UCSC. These can actually be quite helpful to uh, to figure out what is actually going on in the region if you haven't already done this. Now for WashU, this is what the um, uh, annotation tracks look like. And um, 
you can actually click on the, each peak, and like you saw in the genome browser, you can also get the list of cell types. You just don't have to open up a separate window. Um, so the next steps for this are I actually have to open source it, finish up, and clean up the code a bit more. I need to generate this, the, this kind of uh, a demo, uh, primordial encyclopedia for mouse annotations, and then we need to figure out how, what other data to add. Changing gears slightly, Factorbook. How many people here have actually used Factorbook? One, three, five. Okay. So, um, uh, unlike the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of, of my discussion, um, this is not a track based approach to looking at things in, in, uh, in encode data. Here, we're looking at data summarized on TFs in particular. It's not easy to show this in the Genome Browser. This is all about ChIP-seq uh, TF data from ENCODE. Um, and we're trying to pull together a bunch of sort of useful uh, analyses that people can, can look up. There are two different sites now for Factorbook. One is the original one, which is, um, which is a bit aged now. And then this is one I've um, re-implemented. Um, on the main page, you get a, a matrix of um, cell types versus the TFs. Um, the number in the intersection is a number of ChIP-seq experiments from ENCODE that we have. Right now, you can click on the TF. Uh, at some point, you'll be able to click on the cell type also. And then you get a page that has a bunch of information. Um, one part of that is about the function of the TF. And this we've distilled from a bunch of uh, public websites. Uh, and, you know, when possible, we have the protein family, um, um, uh, consensus sequence, uh, multi-level consensus sequence. Uh, if you have a PDB image, we try to pull that in for you. In addition to that, we have these average histone profiles. So what happens is we take a 2 kb window around every summit, every peak, and then we actually compute the average histone signal for that. Um, we split these apart, kind of like in the encyclopedia, into proximal and distal sites. And then you can get, for instance, here, um, proximal H3K24 uh, ME2, uh, or you can get distal H3K4 ME3. And those are color-coded in individually, and this is sort of a little interactive JavaScript chart that you can use to, uh, to explore the data a bit. You can also get, we also provide um, profiles of, of the average nucleosome positioning. This is derived from uh, MNA seq data uh, for GM1278 uh, and K562. And um, this is split again into proximal and distal. Um, proximal is uh, uh, within one, two, uh, one KB of a TSS, and uh, distal is. Uh, is everything else. We also run uh, mean chip, chip on the top 500 peaks, and we generate uh, and we pull out the top five logos, and we are give, going to give you a little bit of information. So, for instance, this is the top one motif um, out of the top 500 chip seek peaks. 484 had this sequence. This was the E value from mean P, a mean chip, and uh, this is the consensus sequence. Um, and lastly, for factor book we have a bunch of these heat maps. So our interest, and maybe it was discussed, alluded to a little bit before, is um, in comparing this TF to other histones in the same cell type and other TFs in the same cell type. So um, in here, if you look here, let's say we're, we're in um, A549 and we're looking at CTCF. We can compare CTCF against the histone control and all the other histone marks we have uh, in A549. Each row here is a, is a chip seek peak. This has been sorted, highest peak to lowest. And this is, uh, for histone, this is a 10 kb window. We then um, um, show the enrichment as a heat map uh, on a normalized scale over the 10 kb window for each histone mark. Likewise, for TF, we show binding strength across all the other TFs available um, in this cell type. Um, this is a little bit narrow window. This is 2 kb. Um, and uh, this, is, this chart is perhaps a touch old. The beta site has a little different orientation of this, but it's the same idea. We have um, uh, chip peaks. Uh, we're going to limit those to 10 kb, uh, 10,000 peaks, uh, sorted by uh, chip seek strength, and then a comparison against all other histone and TFs. The first release of Factorbook had about 550 chip seek data sets. Uh, the new release has uh, over 650 uh, in, more, in more cell types, and uh, we're also now introducing it for mouse. Um, this is still uh, needs a little bit more work on my part, but that will be, become released uh, very soon. So the next steps for Factorbook, Factorbook will also be open sourced. 
And this will go in sync with ENCODE project. As new, uh, as new TF chip data sets are released from ENCODE, we will immediately import them into the uh, factory book. And um, as kind of a new development, we're also giving this a full REST API. So all the, um, all the, for instance, all the profile information, you can actually download via JSON and use yourself. You'll be able to download all the motifs yourself uh, and use in your own programming, in your own projects, very similar to how you would parse JSON from ENCODE project. And lastly, I really um, uh, would uh, plead, if you have any new ideas for Factory Book that you'd like to see, just to email me. I really want to make this a more useful tool and uh, hopefully something that the community can really use for, uh, for a wide variety of things. And that's all I have. And in particular, I'd like to thank Sonia, who really uh, built the primordial uh, 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 encyclopedia, and I took over for her. Um, and that's all I have for now. So we have time for some questions. Do you calculate the profiles on the fly, or do you have to recalculate them? It's all pre-stored. OK, so every time, OK. Uh, quick question from me. So mm -hmm. the things you already on the factory book, is that in sync with the, the current uh, encode uh, data? In beta, for the most part, yes. OK, cool, thanks. For www, no. OK. So when you define the proximal um, from the TSS, is the TSS specific for a major transcript, or how do you decide that? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up for you. OK. Cool. Uh, so uh, thanks, Michael, again. Uh, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, you know that all the slides uh, in this session can be downloaded uh, from the uh, uh, conference website, encode2015.org, and all the handouts are there. So just in case you didn't follow up all the procedures in previous sessions or this session, you can always go to the website and download the PowerPoint and the PDF files. Uh, if the PowerPoint is not there yet, they will be available after the conference.